try to be very brief because uh, I'm the only thing between you and lunch. I'm also hungry, so let's, let's speed it up. So first of all, I would like to thank very warmly the organizers for putting together this really nice workshop. I'm finding it very stimulating and also for giving me the chance to call and inviting me. It's super nice. So thank you for that. And okay, what I will be talking about today is this uh, quantum thermometry, high precision and specifically at low temperatures. So uh, yesterday I learned that when one says quantum <coughs> something, one needs to be very careful and explain what I mean by quantum thermometry. So, okay, high precision thermometry is I want to measure temperature and I want to be able to do it precisely. So I want to be able to design protocols to, to really sense very tiny fluctuations of temperature around some average value, okay? And then uh, what is quantum about this? Well, what I mean by quantum is two things. The first thing is, I want my temperature probes to be small, in the sense that I have uh, spatial resolution in my temperature measurements, which is in the, in the nanoscale regime. So in, in the limit, my temperature probes and my thermometers are going to be individual quantum systems. So, okay, that's one quantum feature of it. Then the other thing is that I, uh, I will focus on low temperatures, in the, in the regime of ultra-low temperature. Why I do that? Because, okay, you can think that if you, if you're going to do practical uh, quantum technological applications, you work in this ultra-cold uh, regime, and you can argue, argue against this, but okay, in many cases you need uh, ultra-cold uh, systems if you want to do error correction and things like that, uh, but you can also do, say, uh, quantum information processing uh, things with uh, room temperature systems like NMR and stuff. Okay, but that's why I focus on the low temperature aspect of it, because it's uh, te potentially technologically relevant. So this is what I mean by quantum thermometry as opposed to, say, nanoscale thermometry, which is completely different stuff. So f before getting into the, the business, I'd like to acknowledge the people that have been involved in one way or another in this whole uh, investigation of thermometry. This started when I was a postdoc in, in Ana San Pérez group in the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona in Spain, although it's not clear anymore if it's in Spain, but it used to be in Spain when I was there, and I was working with Mohamed Bekut, he used to be also a PhD student in Autonoma, now he's with Antonio Asin at ICFO as a postdoc, and uh, together with our friends at the time at ICFO, Martí Perarnau, Karen Jovanisian, Senaida Hernández, and Jair Valeso, who now became my boss in Nottingham, we started looking at these problems of temperature estimation. So, um, this is the outline of the talk, very simple, there's three things. This beginning is just setting the stage and the language. Uh, some of you uh, have already heard about the results that we have on uh, thermometry with uh, strongly coupled individual quantum probe, and I will just repeat it briefly, because this will serve as a motivation to some new things that we are actually uh, finalizing now, and uh, we appreciate especially feedback about that, so just in case in the end, there will be some new results. Okay, so what's the um, kind of uh, mindset that we have? We have uh, some sample, and this sample is going to be in thermal equilibrium. That's the only important thing. This sample system is large compared with my probe. This is an individual quantum system that I'm going to use to sense the temperature of this guy. So this guy is in a deep state, and is much larger than my probe, and I will set up some interaction uh, so that they can exchange energy, and uh, the interaction strength is going to define some dissipation time scale, you know, so there will be some dynamics, and uh, I will reach some, some stationary state, and then I will equilibrate. It doesn't mean I will thermalize in general, as you very well know. So in general, I will have some non-thermal state here. This sample here could also not be in thermal equilibrium anymore, and in general, there will be some correlations that build up between the two. They could be large, they could even be entanglement and weird things like that. So what we are doing is to access the probe only. So we are going to make some measurement of some observable that lives in the probe, Hilbert space, and we are going to get some measurement outcome. So because we know the probe, we kind of have an idea of how the sample can be modeled. We also know what interaction we are setting up. We have a model for the dynamics of the, of the probe. The only thing we don't know is the temperature. So we can work out some, some uh, formula for the average value of whatever observable that we are measuring here. What we do is, okay, we obtain some measurement outcome, one, for this, what should the temperature of the sample be so that I obtain the average value of, so that the average value of this observable that I measure 
measuring coincides with what I just measured. So let me make it clear. I go and I measure something, and I work out what the temperature is compatible with this measurement, and I write it down in a piece of paper. While I did that, this sample had time to re-thermalize to the same initial state. This is crucial, because now I can repeat over and over again this process, and I will until I have a large enough data set of temperature estimates. So once I have this data set of temperature estimates, I, I draw a histogram. And if I did things correctly, the average of the Gaussian that I will get will be centered in the temperature of my sample if my estimator is unbiased. And if I have sufficiently large number of, of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of measurements, I will have a statistical uncertainty that is going to be small. And I want to focus in minimizing the statistical uncertainty, which is the fluctuations around the average value of my temperature of, of the sample. Right? So, so I've just one yeah, yeah. from my experimental perspective, it's going to be extremely difficult to know that this system is in thermal equilibrium. The sample. That, yeah. How do you know that this system has a temperature? I don't know. This is the first thing I write the deep state. Yeah, but that's something you have to, have to yeah, measure. Yeah, yeah. Your probe would have to measure that in the Gibbs state. Would have to be able. I think if you make temperature sensor, he has to be able to measure that this is a real temperature we can measure, and not in some kind of funny energy distribution that I have in some states. That's a key point, I think. And it's also when you can think of nanoscale thermometry. When you do it, you can do it in non-equilibrium systems. You have some, you know, some uh, microelectronic components, and there is some gradients of things, and it's completely out of equilibrium. And then you go with your probe, and with I don't know, non non contact thermal scanning or something, you make a map of temperature. Okay, this is not really temperature, no? you are putting your thermometer, you know that you have some feature of your probe that depends on temperature, and because you calibrated before, then you say, okay, the temperature here locally is this, but what does it mean? I agree with you, and you need to be sure that the thing is in thermal equilibrium. I'm not making any point of this here. Okay. In condensed matter system, you can at least measure the full distribution. Yeah, you have to measure these full distribution yeah. functions or the higher order correlations. Yes. Things like this, and you can say that if this is a thermal, yeah. Well, uh, another way would be to sample this uh, temperature at different frequencies uh, of the bath and see if you get the same result or different result. Because quite often, and as in your case, uh, you may have a, a distribution of those. So, yeah. not a single temperature, yeah, but all temperature. temperature. That's definitely true. That's totally right. But I have to say that this is, for this talk, not a problem because yeah. I am in thermal equilibrium. No, I just wanted to know if you said that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Huh? It, you know, it would be interesting to see the sensor, to make a sensor that can do that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to say is, uh, if, if we are in thermal equilibrium, mm -hmm. what would be uh, the, the properties of a good uh, temperature probe, right? So you are measuring some observable to work out the, the estimate of the temperature, and what you would like is that the average of this observable changes with temperature, because if it doesn't change with temperature, then it's not a good sensor of temperature, right? You want it to change a lot, but you also want the distribution to be narrow, because you want to be able to use the, the, the distribution for this observable as a temperature gauge, right? So this is something I will call thermal sensitivity, and it turns out this is tightly upper bounded by the quantum fissure information, which is something I'm not going to explain or talk about in any way. Just it's very intuitively related to this very reasonable kind of figure of merit. I will use this as a figure of merit for thermometry, and I will use the, the concept thermal sensitivity to refer indistinctly to this guy and that guy. But that's the intuitive interpretation of it. And if you want a bit more formal understanding of fissure information, in mind you have the reduced state of the probe. At when the sample is at temperature T, and you change a little bit the temperature of the sample, if you see that the fidelity, this is like the Ullmann fidelity between the two states, when temperature changes a little bit, uh, drops a lot, then it means that your probe is a good temperature sensor because it immediately detects any little change in temperature, right? So this feature information is quantified somehow, this notion that the state is sensitive to temperature change, right? Okay, so that's what I want to say. Second part. So now, let's, uh, let's uh, use, let's, let's uh, take some model, specific model of a probe in contact with a bath. And we're going, I'm going to take the typical thing, you know, a caldera layer model, which I can also solve exactly, and sometimes even analytically, which is very nice. Uh, so I have a bath, so this, of course, uh, appeared in Jens' talk, 
yesterday, but uh, yeah, we give very little detail here. So I have a bath which is made of uh, a collection of uncoupled harmonic oscillators, and my probe is going to be the central oscillator, and it's going to be coupled to each of the environmental modes. There is uh, infinitely many of these modes, and they are continuously distributed, and so on. I'm going to make them in a thermal state, a thermal routine. Again, I'm just saying it's thermal. And uh, it's initially uncorrelated with my probe. The Hamiltonian would look something like this. OK, this is the probe, this is the bath. And there is some like position, position coupling, which is the typical kind of thing that we do. In order to model what the interactions look like, you can, you can write the spectral density like this. Okay? So what I'm going to be using is like an omic spectral density. This is going to be 1D. And uh, I will put some Lorentz type of cutoff because it's easy to do the calculations with it. Just the only reason for that. And then uh, I just want to mention that I'm being careful here. And because I'm going to change the strength of the interaction of the probe and the sample, I'm going to renormalize carefully the frequency of the central oscillator. Because you know, if you just write a system like that, it may be that it's not, the energy is not bounded from below. So it may be that interactions is so big that if you go in the normal mode picture, the lower most normal mode is like an imaginary frequency or something crazy like that. Okay? So you must make sure that the frequency of the central oscillator is large enough. And we are making sure of this by adding this by hand, this famous caldera legged counter term piston. So we are aware of this and we are taking care of it. Okay? Uh, now, uh, without giving any details at all, just this picture, you can write the Heisenberg equations of motion for all the degrees of freedom of your path and your probe. And you can get this effective equation for the probe. This is like a harmonic oscillator, which is being driven by some stochastic quantum force. This star here means convolution. So that this term here is like a memory kernel thing. And this memory kernel and the, and the stochastic force are related to fluctuation dissipation zero. Uh, and this is like the quantum Langevin equation. Uh, you can solve this equation. Okay? And why? Uh, you can solve exactly this equation for the steady state. Uh, the only assumptions here are the probe and sample, as I said, they are uncorrelated initially. The sample is initially in thermal equilibrium. And because the whole thing is, is uh, quadratic, the whole uh, Hamiltonian is quadratic, the steady state is going to be fully described by the second order moment. And uh, what happens if you, if you compare the thermal equilibrium assumptions? You assume that the probe is going to be in thermal equilibrium. You get some, some distribution in in phase space like that, but if you solve the quantum Langevin equation when the probe and the sample are strongly coupled, you will see some squeezing in the position quadrant. Why in the position quadrant? Because I'm coupling the position to the position. If I was coupling something else, there would be some other relevant quadrature that would get squeezed. So it is important that that strong coupling, I get this reduction of the noise in the relevant quadrature, right? OK, so this is some plots that we did after we were able to solve that, get the analytical exact steady state. We are plotting here the relative error for temperature estimation. So it's this Fisher information that I showed you before. It's a logarithmic scale here. And you can see that as temperature goes to zero, this thing diverges. Okay, so the relative error as for zero temperature is infinite. But for any arbitrarily small but finite temperature, what you will see is that as you increase the strength of the probe sample coupling, you will get a monotonic reduction, which is quite significant, of the relative error in temperature estimation. So you learn from this plot that one thing you want to do if your temperature is very low, and you have therefore a very large uh, relative error in your temperature estimate, is if you can control the coupling of the probe and the sample, make it stronger, as strong as you possibly can, because you get this monotonic reduction <coughs> in the precision of thermometer. Right? Now, second thing that we learn from this analysis, uh, because I'm plotting this Fisher information, is this abstract notion. I, I don't know what I have to measure to actually estimate temperature with this uh, small statistical uncertainty. I'm not saying what, which is the observable O that I had in the beginning of the talk. I'm just saying that there is some observable for which statistic, statistical uncertainty will be reduced if I strengthen the coupling and so on. So here, for instance, we are looking at I'm not going to explain this, okay? but we're going to just look at the specific thermal sensitivity of measuring the variance of the quadrature that gets reduced. So you remember that the steady state was a squeeze thing like that. If we measure this width here, this width is very sensitive to temperature. And 
Again, when the coupling between the probe and the sample is sufficiently strong, this is almost optimal. So it almost coincides with the theoretical upper bound given by this fission information. So what I'm telling you here is that if you have a system like that and you want to measure very precisely, very low temperatures, look at the quadrature, which is squeezed, and this is going to be a quasi-optimal temperature estimate. Okay, now another thing that we learn is that we want to look at how does the thermal sensitivity decay as the temperature goes to zero. This is now the logarithm of inverse temperature, so temperature is going to zero this way, and we see that uh, you get the power law uh, scaling, which is uh, roughly, well not roughly, it's pretty good agreement with uh, something like T squared. So the thermal sensitivity, the best that you can ever possibly do in estimating temperature, is going, is dropping to zero as T squared in this model. Okay, so it's a polynomial type of scale. Now, um, okay, so this connects a bit with uh, Fred's talk uh, yesterday. Uh, so why do we care about this model? No? Okay, this is a model I can solve fine, but uh, this is something physical. Well, this uh, recent uh, work by the group of uh, Maciek Lewinstein and Ikto, and uh, they were looking precisely at the same model that Fred was explaining yesterday. You know? So you remember from the talk there was uh, this Fred somewhere? Okay. So there was this uh, bunch of uh, sodium uh, atoms in this PEC, and, um, and there were these kind of impurities, if you like, this lithium that were, uh, there were not so many of them, and they were trapped and so on. So in the end, the theoretical description that he wrote down in his talk was this frolic Hamiltonian. It turns out, according to these people, in some suitable regime, you can, you can make a bunch of approximations on this Froelich, Froelich Hamiltonian and it becomes a caldera legged model, like the, just, the one I just wrote. So you have a physical system that maybe it's interesting to measure the temperature of this BDC, and maybe it occurs to me that the Gershon's uh, refrigerator business may be interesting. No, if you are cooling down this BDC, you want to know precisely the temperature. If you don't have reliable temperature measurements, maybe you want to do something like that. If you are in the regime in which this Froelich Hamiltonian becomes a caldera legged model. And I'm telling you what you have to measure also. So, okay, maybe practical, but maybe not, but it could be applied in this sense. Okay, now the last thing, um, which is a bit of a contradiction with what I just said. Okay, you can show, and I'm not going to show, that if you have translational invariant spin chain, and it's at a thermal equilibrium at some temperature, it can be large, it can be small, anything. If you have an exponential clustering of correlations, in other words, if you are away from criticality, if you have short-range interactions and there's no kinds of troubles, you can show using results of uh, locality of temperature quite easily, actually, that um, thermal sensitivity of a small part of a translational invariant spin chain like this is exponentially decaying as you send the temperature to zero. And you can generalize this using some results by Jens uh, to gapped harmonic chains. Because in gapped harmonic chains, uh, translational invariant, one dimension, you also get this exponential clustering of, clustering of correlations, and you can use the same business. Okay. Sure. So, um, I will not prove it to you, but I will show you a picture. So let's, uh, let's take a bunch of harmonic oscillators in 1D. They all have the same frequency. We put periodic boundary condition. This is in 1D. No, I'm making the, the rounded thing because they are periodic boundary condition. And uh, so it's translational invariant. We are going to put the whole thing in thermal equilibrium. We are going to set up some interactions there. We are not going to restrict to nearest neighbors or something like that. We are saying that everybody interacts with everybody with some sort of power law type of thing. So this is like the distance between any two nodes. And the strength of the interaction is this G, so the further you are, the weaker the interaction. And uh, in this alpha here, you just have to make sure that you put a large number, say 2, 3, whatever random thing that you can think of. It's not 0.1 or something like that. Okay? So if you do that, you write a Hamiltonian, you go and find the normal modes of this system. Very easy to do. So what you can do when you do that is to write the covariance matrix for this guy here. When the total thing is in thermal equilibrium, you go to normal modes, you write the total covariance matrix because you know the transformation between the regular coordinates and the normal mode coordinates, you can very easily work out this guy and calculate the Fisher information for temperature. And as I promised, there is exponential inefficiency in low temperature thermometry. This is a log of Fisher information, this is inverse temperature, linear thing means exponential decay. 
So that it's true, right? But so this is a bit of a problem, no? Because if you have such a gap, translational invariant harmonic chain, you can always rewrite it as a star model, like the Caldera legged model, which would be a limiting thing. So what's the problem here? So I have one theorem that tells me I have this this exponential inefficiency of low temperature thermometry, and then I have this numerical results, if you if you want, from the Caldera legged model that tell me I have a polynomial decay. So the explanation is here. What you do is you take <coughs> translational invariant harmonic chain and turn it into a star system. You just write separately the coordinates of the central guy of your probe, and you bring all the other peripheral oscillators into normal modes, and you work out what would be the effective star type Hamiltonian. And this guy here would be the equivalent of the spectral density that you get. And you can plot it. And you will find something like this. Okay, spectral density looks kind of reasonable. Uh, you get this sort of linear kind of increase. You get a kind of smooth high frequency cutoff, but then there is a gap here. So there is a bunch of frequencies in the environment which do not appear. If you have this translational invariant chain, which is the gap, you get an effective spectral density that your probe is filling, which is like this. This is kind of unusual. When you do open systems, you don't get stuff like that. What you actually try to do is something like this, which is very nicely ohmic. It has a high frequency cutoff. And I obtained this nice shape by tuning the frequency of my oscillators in such a way that the system became gapless. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that this caldera legged model doesn't map into a gapped translational invariant harmonic chain. Therefore, the result of the exponential inefficiency of the model is not applicable. It indeed maps into a gapless translational invariant chain. So I cannot use this exponential clustering of correlations, so therefore I get a much better scaling of thermal sensitivity at low temperatures. And this is indeed what happens. You can just go your, the other way. You can start from the star model. You can discretize your frequencies and keep adding environmental oscillators in such a way that the coupling strengths are tuned to this prescription that I had in the beginning. And uh, what you see is that the gap that appears in your system closes in the thermodynamic limit and closes like x squared. And uh, therefore, the caldera legged model that I was showing in the beginning really maps to a gapless translational invariant harmonic chain. Therefore, it's not strange to see that that's much better scaling of thermal sensitivity at low temperatures. And that's it. Okay, that's the conclusion. And uh, just uh, this nice picture of the group. Uh, Very nothing with open systems once in a while. And, uh, Thank you.